Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, he never saw it coming. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this segment of the show is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. Hey, it's great to have you along. we got some great guests today. First of all, we're going to start with Thomas McKenty. He is with Abundant Genealogy, and he's the guy who's kind of made famous the genealogy do-over. Well, we're talking now about the DNA do-over, and since 20. 18 is shaping up to be the year of DNA. You're going to want to hear what Thomas has to say coming up in about nine minutes or so. Then later in the show, David Allen Lambert is going to rejoin us after doing this segment with us here in just a few moments, talking about what's happening in your family histoire news. And we're going to talk about these amazing runaway ads. And uh, I recently found one concerning a third great grandfather who abandoned his family. And you're going to want to hear where you can find some of these things and the amazing detail you can learn about your ancestor through these digitized newspaper ads that go way back. That's going to be a lot of fun. By the way, David, David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, AmericanAncestors.org. I finally got my pirate coin the other day that I picked up on eBay. A six, oh. Yeah, a 1695 Cobb coin, a Spanish Cobb coin, otherwise known as a doubloon or a piece of eight, dated 1695, and I picked it up from Spain for 15 bucks, and that was the year my pirate ancestor was part of the big raid on the Indian ship in the Red Sea. So my granddaughter went pretty nuts holding the pirate coin related to her well, ancestor. Well, that's great. Now, you're going to have to let me know the next time you see one of those, because I want to buy one, too. Oh, yeah. They are <laughs> out there. What I can't get over is how expensive they generally are, but yep. this yep. was 15 bucks because it wasn't in great shape, but because of the fact that I could clearly read the date, that was enough for me, and I could put it in our yeah. ancestral coin book with the kids, and uh, they, they really enjoy having that. Anyway, nice to have you here. We got a lot of family history our news today, so let's get it started. Okay, well, the first story is kind of a horror story, Fish. It takes place up in Berwick, Nova Scotia, where the Bennett family, hoping to see their dearly departed body before the funeral, discovered that the lady in the casket was not her. Ooh. So what did they Nor do? Nor was the second lady in the casket they brought out thinking <laughs> that was her. Oh, no. Turns out this poor lady, Sandra Bennett, was cremated, oh. which was not the family's wishes. Oh. And uh, it's caused them to be quite upset, as you can imagine. Yes. To think that three bodies all misidentified and then one of them was accidentally cremated. That's quite a mess up there in Nova yeah, Scotia. Yeah, I would say. And, and how upsetting for the family, ultimately. And where is she now? That kind of thing. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> Hopefully she won't turn up as cremated remains in some courthouse for 18 years, like right. the one we talked about before. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Well, the next story is kind of a horror story, because in recent news, we've heard all the things about the influenza problems in California and throughout the country, and it brings us back to something that happened a century ago, and I love the story that I saw on ExtremeGenes.com, where you talk about the 10 myths about the 1918 flu pandemic. Yes, it's fascinating stuff. You know, I, I don't want to read through all of them, but I just want to say, like, for instance, the pandemic originated in Spain, because they call it the Spanish flu, and, right. and well, the truth of that is, no one believes the so-called Spanish flu came from Spain. And then there are nine other things. Even in my own family fish, my great-grandmother died in 1920, and our family said that they believe that the flu came over with the dead bodies in Europe that were brought over after the war. A lot of folks so, believe I mean, that. Yeah. You have these urban legends that start. And here I am four generations later. Maybe these <laughs> ten myths We'll debunk my family story, and I'll tell it correct from now on. And I'll tell you what, when we posted this on our Facebook page, we got more stories from people explaining how they lost their loved ones to the flu pandemic in 1918. Here it is exactly 100 years later, and everybody still knows the story of how their loved one died a horrible death uh, from that disease back in the day. It just 
goes to show that we really do never forget our family members, nope. even if it was 100 years ago. Well, Henry Louis Gates recently had talked about some of the last slave ships in America, and this one is from 160 years ago. This is a Gulf Coast wreck called the Clotilda, and this was found in the Mobile, Alabama area, embedded in the side of a riverbank. And they believe this vessel may be that of the last known vessel that had brought slaves from Africa to the United States. Isn't that amazing? In 1860, who knew that it was happening that late? Because I know Jefferson passed a law back around 1812 that ended bringing new slaves over, and yet some people still managed to do it. And uh, this was one of those ships. Wow. It's sad, but maybe part of this can be excavated out of the mud and put on display. Yeah. Well, my next story goes over to the Emerald Isle, to Dublin, where you can actually go to the Hotel Shelbourne and get a genealogy butler. Yeah, isn't this cool? You know, the Irish have really embraced genealogy as a great way to bring people over to see the motherland, basically, for Irish Americans, because there are more Irish people here than there are over there. And so not only has the government embraced it, but now so are the hotels and other people connected with tourism. It's great, and I think that this is something that could take off in America as well. All right, every week I like to give a blogger spotlight shout-out, and this week it is to Melissa Dickerson, who is the Genealogy Girl Talks blogger on genealogygirltalks.com. And Melissa talks about a variety of adventures in genealogy, but one that struck me is her blog post recently on how to find pictures of my World War I ancestors. So I thought that was engaging. It kind of ties into what I'm doing tonight. I'm going to be giving a lecture at the Boston Public Library on that very same topic, finding your World War I veteran ancestors. And if you can't come to Boston tonight to see me, well, guess what? I'll be at Roots Tech giving that same talk. And because I'm half Canadian, the other half of the lecture is how to find your Canadian World War I veteran. Sweet. NEHGS would love to have our listeners become members at NEHGS and come here to Boston. You can join NEHGS. And if you want to save $20, use the checkout code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. Hey, Fish, before I run off to give my lecture, let's talk about some of these runaway ads. All right. We'll get to that coming up a little bit later in the show, David. So thanks so much. Talk to you in a few. And coming up next, he is the man behind the genealogy do-over, and now he's promoting the DNA do-over. Thomas McKenty's on from Abundant Genealogy. You're going to want to hear what he has to say. Coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher, and whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech. It's the world's largest family history conference. Now, you can join everybody for four days of discovery and make connections to your past, enjoy world-class entertainment, interactive booths, and hundreds of hands-on classes. Listen to celebrity speakers like former Olympic gold medalist Scott Hamilton and Brandon Stanton, the founder of the Humans of New York photo blog and Henry Louis Gates Jr., host of the hit PBS show, Finding Your Roots. Purchase your four-day Roots Tech Pass today and save over $80 on a regularly priced pass. Learn the latest about DNA. Explore recently released record sets and interact with exciting technology. You can join the excitement and the fun. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover Roots Tech. Roots Tech 2018, February 28th through March 3rd at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City, Utah. Register at RootsTech.org. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. 
Com. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Jeans, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Jeans Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Jeans Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Jeans rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeJeans.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well known family history experts. Catch visits with genealogy stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. Hey, as we heard from Judy Russell on our very first show of 2018, the theme is always DNA this year because of the growth and the changes and the matches. And what do you do with this stuff? Well, it's Fisher here. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. And this segment is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And I've got my friend from Chicago, Thomas McKenty, on the line. He's with AbundantGenealogy.com. Thomas is the guy who got us going with the genealogy do-over some time back, and we talked about that. And now he's on to the DNA. DNA do-over. Thomas, fill us in. What's this about? Hey, Fisher. Happy New Year. Yeah, I'm really excited about the DNA do-over. You know, what I saw over the past year at the genealogy do-over is people were saying, I've taken a test, I've done a DNA test with my heritage DNA or another company, and then they're saying, but I haven't done anything with it. So I created the DNA do-over similar to the genealogy do-over so that we could put our results to work. You know, we spend good money on these tests. We spend time on these tests. And there's no reason they should just sit there. The thing is, the whole area, the genetic genealogy thing, is growing at a rapid pace. There are new third-party tools. There are new ways of looking at the data that you really need to understand a certain protocol of things like how to download your data for safekeeping, where to upload it to. So that's really what the DNA do-over is about. It's about putting those results to work. Right. And there's so many people who go on and they get a kit maybe for Christmas and they're excited to learn their ethnicity. And then that's it. There's no tree. They get scared because of uh, people reaching out to them for matches and and they don't know what to do with that. Is this where you're taking it, basically moving them to the next step? Yeah, we do. And and the thing is, if you look at it from an industry standpoint, right now, DNA, it's almost treated as if it's a parlor game, like it's a magic eight ball or a Ouija board, you know, (laughs) and it's a fun game. And then we're going to put it away and and I'm done. Or people have even said, well, I've done my family history. I did a DNA test. I know my ethnicity. Yeah, that's not the right answer. The thing is also from from the industry standpoint, we want them to if we don't want a revolving door, we have brought them into genealogy and family history through DNA. It's a great welcome mat. It's a great hook, but we've got to keep them there. We've got to keep them busy in the sandbox. So one thing to do is to say, hey, did you know you can do this with your results? And and in a minute, I want to talk about the big growth area on health and DNA, but that's what it is. This is where this is going on the continuum, is we can't just have it stop at 6 million people via Ancestry have results. We need to actually get them involved. So where do you tell them to start? They've done the test. They haven't posted a tree. They don't know anything other than, hey, I got my ethnicity. And, of course, as we know, those can vary widely depending on the algorithms of the company. What do you say to them? Where do you get them started? Well, first thing is I want them to download it because it is their asset. It's something they paid for. It is portable. And the thing is the companies don't make it easy for you to download it. Uh, They don't tell you you can download your data. Of course, they want you to stay. But the thing is you own that data. So you should download it to the zip file, back it up, and then you should go and work within the testing company platform where you tested and see what they offer for matches and read everything. And Fisher, I'm a big stickler on reading the terms and conditions in the TOS. Understand privacy issues. Are they going to get your email or is it an email relay system? Understand how matching works. Because that's what I've always said to clients. If we do DNA testing, you might find some matches that are going to be unsettling. You might find a non-parental event, yeah. you know, uh, and things like that. But I do strongly encourage not only matching within the 
testing company, but taking your data and then importing it. My heritage has free imports. A lot of people right. don't know that. Yes. Uh, because some companies charge for that. So you should be importing it into my heritage and then wait the two or three days and you'll get amazing different matches, new matches, because people use different platforms. And when you consider that my heritage is really the place where you might find some European matches. That's what happened with me, with German. Yes. I mean, my German Hennebergs, I was not getting the matches I wanted on Ancestry and other platforms. And boom, as soon as I upload it to my heritage, I'm getting contacts from cousins in Denmark and Germany. Yeah, and I think this is one of the stories of 2018 now, because when my heritage started, they were kind of late to the game. And in the process, however, of bringing in all these people who are transferring copies of their material over to them, people are starting to find matches overseas. And this is a big deal. Exactly. And the thing is that uh, MyHeritage has a great community in Europe, in Germany, especially in Poland and that. And the people that I've worked with through messaging and connecting, they've been great, so friendly, and they've helped me understand some of the local record sets some of the local geography. All right, so you've shared your DNA with other companies. You've transferred across. I would assume there are some third-party places you have recommendations for. There are. One is GEDmatch, G-E-D-M-A-T-C-H.com is one of the bigger ones. And the other one is a new one that is health-related, Prometheace, P-R-O-M-E-T-H-E-A-S-E. Dot com. Now, they charge a $5 fee, which is relatively nothing. Right. But you get some of the same results that you would pay at 23andMe for their $199 test. And so the thing is, everyone's got their own proprietary, but you will get some indicators. I would say if 2018 is a DNA, 2019, watch out for the health focus. That's where the industry is going. What you may not know is Ancestry owns AncestryHealth.com. They've been sitting on that domain in beta. And I wouldn't be surprised if they release a product similar to 23andMe. Hmm. So what will happen, Fisher, is if you've already tested with Ancestry DNA, you'll buy these add-ons, much like Helix.com is doing it, H-E-L-I-X.com. They have a base test, and then it's cafeteria style. You just say, okay, I want this health report, this health report, and this health report. My feeling and my research shows that this is where Ancestry is going to go with its product. Well, it, it certainly sounds that way. And we're hearing Congress now is looking into well, what are people telling us about DNA? What are they hiding from us? Do you see some right. problems uh, coming up with that? Yeah, privacy has always been one of these things. It's a feel-good thing for politicians. They feel like they're doing something yeah. for their constituents <laughs> when they claim, seriously, when they claim down on like access to public records and things like that. And we try and tell them, you know, you really can't steal the idea of a dead person, et cetera. So the thing is, that's why as genealogists and thankfully groups like the Association of Professional Genealogists, the National Genealogical Society, they lobby on our behalf as genealogists and they try and set the record straight that we we want you to really research this, not just a knee-jerk reaction to privacy. I mean, think of that. When you go to the doctor now, Fisher, when I have blood drawn, I know that it's in a database. I know the results are there. My doctor's research is in a database. It's not much different, really, right now. Right. So what we don't want to see long-term is we don't want to see life insurance companies using it for redlining people because of certain conditions, et cetera. I can see where there's the concern there. But right now, I feel pretty comfortable with some of the protections, but we always have to stay on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm talking to Thomas McKenty with AbundantGenealogy.com. He's the man behind the DNA Do-Over, and you can check that out at DNADoOver.com, which will get you over to a Facebook page, and you can become part of that group. So what's another facet to this Do-Over, Thomas? This is the one thing that I'm seeing on the Do-Over, is people don't know how to share these results with family and friends in a non-genealogy way. I don't know about you, Fisher, but when I would pull out the family tree with my family, they'd scatter like cockroaches, <laughs> they would. You know. But the thing is, if I could tell a story or I had a photo book, they were right there. So what we're seeing is like through Family Chart Masters, they do now a DNA print where you can take your ancestry results and for as low as $20, you can do a print that shows the map, the ethnicity, your image in the corner, and it's a really neat gift idea or something to put in with your display. So I think we're going to see more of these products where we can take our results. We're the keeper of genealogy maybe for running a project for the whole family, 
but we want to share it with them in a way that they can understand. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you about this, Thomas. What if you had an ancestor, perhaps it's a parent or a grandparent that tested, okay? And it's under their own account. You're not the administrator for it, and they pass away. Is there some way to obtain administration of that account with the various companies? There is, and this is what I would do. I would approach a company. This is something that we're seeing long-term right now with baby boomers and our digital footprint, Fisher. I mean, what are you doing in terms of successorship for data? Yeah. You know, and the thing is, Yahoo is very strict. If you want to take over someone's Yahoo email account, you have to give them a certified death certificate, prove that you're the executor, et cetera. So I would be surprised that more companies like Ancestry and MyHeritage start adding this successor or legacy-type person. What I would do first is contact the customer service for the DNA testing platform and explain the situation. And you're going to have to have backup data. You're going to have to have at least the account name. Sure. And you're probably going to need to prove death because anyone could go in and say, oh, yeah, so-and-so died. And it's a way of hacking into their information. Right. But you may have to be the executor or you may have to have the executor do it. You may need to send them a copy of a certified death certificate. But that is the way that I would approach it. Boy, it sounds like a complicated thing, but I'm hearing about this from other people all the time going, wait a minute, what do I do with this? What do I do now? Right. Or maybe grandma is now in a nursing home and incapable exactly. of, of doing anything, and you want to be able right. to access things, yeah. uh, and, and you don't have that. So that's, that's so what another... I've done, Fisher, is actually my list of all my logins and passwords and my digital footprint are part of my estate planning papers. Yep. Uh, they're in my safe. I update it about once a year, and, and that way I'm making it easier for my executor and my family after I'm gone. Well, I, I think that's wisdom no matter what. I think that's ultimately a major part of what we have to do for our planning for when we're exactly. gone, don't you think? Yeah. Yes, I agree. All right. Once again, the site is AbundantGenealogy.com. And if you want to be part of the Facebook group, you can go to DNADoover.com. He's Thomas McKenty out of Chicago, Illinois. Thomas, great insight. I love what you're doing. I think it makes a lot of sense for people to do do-overs with their genealogy as a whole and with DNA for people who just haven't a obtain the information that they need to do just yet. Exactly, yes. All right, my friend, thanks for coming on. Happy New Year, and look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, Fisher. Bye-bye. And coming up next, David is back as we talk about runaway ads and personal description ads from the 18th and 19th centuries. Wait till you hear some of these things and what you can learn from them in five minutes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. (laughs) 
And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher at this end, the Radio Roots Luth, and this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. And David Allen Lambert is back. You're now my guest for this segment, David. It's good to have you here. And I'm kind of excited about this because recently I stumbled upon one of those personal ads, you know, where people disappear or run off. And uh, I've got a, a little collection growing on these things, and I know you've run into some of these things as well. <laughs> Talk about these runaway ads. How far back do they go, to your knowledge? Well, I mean, in Boston in 1690, we had the first issue of a paper published anywhere in the colonies. Unfortunately, it was one issue. <laughs> the <laughs> Crown crushed the idea, and freedom of speech was quelled until about 1704 when the Boston Newsletter was published. And that was the first continuous paper published in the colonies. And then after that, every other printing press popped up along the colonies. And so I see them back as early as the early 1700s. Wow. This is my one, two, three, four, five fifth great grandfather and this would be from the 1760s in new york and it says whereas abigail the wife of daniel secord of new rochelle has eloped from her said husband this is to desire all persons from trusting her on his account for he will pay no debts of her contracting from the date hereof, Daniel Secord. So that was the first one I had ever seen, and I thought, okay, that tells us a lot right there. The wife ran off with somebody else, and he's just not going to pay the bills, which I think is kind of typical of, of many of these ads, right? It really is. In fact, I have a similar one, which was kind of the first one I found, which I like to call domestic bliss ending advertisements. <laughs> the only person on my family tree named David is a David Whitney who was a Rebel War veteran, my fifth great grandfather. And in 1790, he's on the census alone. He had been married four times. All of his wives had died. And his last wife was Lydia Moore. So Lydia in 1785 marries David. 1790, he's alone in the census. Yeah, found an ad in the paper in 1789. I, David Whitney of Standish, Maine, forbid all those from trusting my wife, Lydia, who has eloped from my bed and board. Yeah. So he didn't want to be run into ruin by his, quote, runaway bride. Yeah, exactly. So this is interesting because it doesn't just cover runaway wives. It also can cover runaway husbands like this one I just found last week concerning my third great grandfather over in England. And this was in an 1818 newspaper in jolly old London. And listen, by the way, to how detailed this little ad is and giving us information about him. Whereas James Stocks, a native of Scotland, by trade a shoemaker, hath deserted his wife named Catherine and five children in August last, who are becoming chargeable to the parish of St. James Westminster. The said James Stocks, at the time of deserting his wife and family, lodged at number 16 Leicester Street. He lately worked for Mr. Pratt in Clipstone Street. Whoever was will then provide information to the church wardens and overseers of the poor of the parish of St. James Westminster so that he can be brought to justice shall receive a reward of two guineas. But that's not all. The said James Stocks is 39 years of age, about five foot six inches high, fair complexion, dark hair, dark eyes, and round visage. That would be the face. And had on when he went away a drab color great coat, dark striped waistcoat, Fustain trousers, that's like corduroy, worsted stockings, and shoes. I mean, that is the most incredible ad that I have ever run into as far as detail goes about an ancestor. I've seen a lot of Boston ones with a similar thing where employees, and now may it be an indentured servant or when slavery was still legal in Massachusetts, they'll mention in detail, just like you mentioned the drab colored jacket. I mean, this is the type of thing where they give all this detail. They ran away with this, that, and the other thing. Like, if you saw them wearing this, yeah. <laughs> why didn't you catch them at the door? <laughs> in fact, one of them is described, you know, has a slight droop to the eye, uh, <laughs> freckle on the nose. I'm like, like, wow. I mean, you don't need a photograph in the 18th no. century because these people have great memories of their employees and it's amazing. Uh, people in servitude. And this one, obviously, by giving me the age, now I have a birth year pretty close. And I'd had conflicting records from census records and death records of his children as to whether he was from England or Scotland. So this clarified that. But I already knew he was a shoemaker, his wife's name. The number of children, I had four. This says five. So that tells me that one of them is not showing up in the christening records. And we have to find where that person went. 
Well, you know, it always opens up new adventures. But sometimes it's about an ancestor that you don't want to find. I have an ad for an ancestor, Henry Poor, my third great-grandfather, who was passing a bad hand of note, essentially something that wasn't his, passing it off to get credit. And I was like, oh. Yeah, he's, he's, he's basically forged a check. Mm-hmm. That may explain why he came to Boston, Massachusetts. So it's not so bad that it's on one side of the family. On the other <laughs> side of the family, my great-grandfather, who was a carpenter in Halifax in the 1860s, goes to Colchester, Nova Scotia. And I wish this website was still up because I'd like to search more. It was around for about a year. Private little place that had been transcribing newspapers. James Lambert of Colchester did not pay his membership in the Carpenters' Union. He had been an architect and is nowhere to be seen. Well, I know where he was. He left and went to saint pierre Miquelon, which is an island off of Nova Scotia, which is technically France. So there may be more newspaper articles to read on old James. <laughs> wow, that would be a fun one. And then I ran into this. This one has nothing to do with any ancestor, but I thought it was just absolutely incredible. It's from New York City in 1767, and it's says, whereas on the first instant of October, which was the way they referred to things back then, Weirt C. Banta, a young man of this city, Carpenter, advertised his wife Elizabeth for elopement. And whereas most people from the similarity of the names, taking me to be the person, as I am noted throughout the whole city, my name is Weirt H. Banta carpenter living in Bato street therefore i desire the public to take notice of the names as the one is weird c banta and my name weird h banta and my wife's name is hannah i advertise this that the names may be distinguished and my character not stained <laughs> <laughs> well that's covering your bases isn't it yeah i think so so, obviously, you can go to Genealogy Bank to find things like this. You can go to Chronicling America, which is the Library of Congress newspaper site. And, sure. of course, Newspaper Archive. You can go to newspapers.com. And, of course, for New York City and New York State in that area, there's FultonHistory.com. It's an amazing site with over 30 million pages there. So you can find these ads pretty much anywhere that digitizes newspapers. And the thing that I want to point out to people is that a lot of people get discouraged, especially people early on. They don't find a newspaper for the town their ancestor lived in. I always say put a push pin in a map and then look at the surrounding towns up to five to ten miles out. Because if I'm a newspaper salesman and I want to sell my newspaper to you, I'm going to cover ads and news in your community. So they may not be, for instance, a Dorchester, Massachusetts paper from the time you're looking for, but there could be one in Boston or there could be one in Milton that was covering the news at that time. So don't give up just because it's not the same location your ancestor lived in. Hey, Atlanta, Georgia, Dotham, Alabama. I mean, you name it. It's all over the country. This is not a new thing. And in fact, it's, as we pointed out earlier, from out of the country as well. You can find them in England. And I would imagine, David, I've never seen one, but they must have had these in places like France as well. Oh, I'm sure. And, you know, these legal notices we're talking, I mean, if you look in the legal notice part of the paper today, you'll see that John Smith is divorcing his wife, Mary Smith, or vice versa. And it still goes on. I mean, I can remember when my grandmother divorced my grandfather and he had been out of the picture for a while. She said to George Lambert of Parts Unknown. I mean, I guess our right. listeners are hearing all the dirt on my family in this episode. So. <laughs> but this is in the 1940s. That's right. <laughs> hey, David, it's been fun. Really interesting stuff, and I appreciate that. And coming up for you next, of course, Tom Perry talking preservation on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in three minutes. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. And welcome back. It is America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. And this is the time we talk preservation with our preservation authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on Extreme Genes. And this segment is brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. How are you doing, preservation authority? I'm doing really, really good. On the road again this week, which I'm pretty much going to be on the road probably for the rest of my life. I just love getting out there and (laughs) helping people preserve their memories coast to coast and around the globe. Well, great way to go, Tom. And and we do have a question here from Reggie Wright Jukes. He is a certified fitness trainer, and he says, hey, do you splice 16-millimeter film? And this is a good question because my first thought would be, well, why would you want to splice something? You just digitize it, and you go through, and you edit it digitally these days. But maybe he has something else in mind what do you say to reggie yeah when you have film somehow it's broke because it's old or whatever or you did the big no-no and ran it through a projector without cleaning it first and it snapped yeah we can splice that unless your film is really really bad we don't charge you for the splices and the best way to do if you want to splice it go ahead otherwise just bring it into us and when we're cleaning it and we see it's broken we'll splice it properly now, some people say, hey, I've got some film. There's a lot of bad stuff in there I don't want. I've got one of those little crank things. I want to go through and look at it first and cut out what I don't want. And you can do that, and it's a really easy thing to do. When you go through and cut out the film, you want to leave about an inch of bad on both ends when you cut it. Because then what you do, you get painter's tape. Painter's tape? Yep. <laughs> no, like you're making this up. Come on now. No, I'm as serious as a heart attack. You get that blue <laughs> painter's tape. Or you get that green frog tape. What you do, you cut the tape in about one inch length and you cut it narrower enough so it's not as wide as the film. And then just put it together like that. Put it on your reel, go through, cut out another section, put it together. Because then what we will do as we're going through and cleaning it, we'll see that painter's tape and then we'll splice it properly. That's why you want to leave some bad on both ends. Okay. When we splice it, it's better to have a little bit of bad on than a little bit of good gone. So then we'll go through and cut it real easy so you don't have to be fancy. Just do that. It's real simple to do. 
and then it'll make it fancy. The only time we ever charge is we've had some film that was so bad, it was like every two and a half feet, it was broken again. And that can get kind of costly, but that is very rare. I'd say maybe I've seen that a half a dozen times in all of our years. So that's the easiest way to take care of it. Just get the blue painter's tape by 3M or get that green frog tape. And the most important thing is don't cut it wider than the film. You want it inside the sprockets. So when we're going through and cleaning it, it's running on a sprocket system. Then when we get to it, we splice it properly, and then everything's sweet and easy. Now, is this kind of a standard thing that people like yourself who digitize around the country would do? You know, I really don't know. I've actually never talked to anybody about it. It's just the way I came up with that's easy for customers to go in and do it. Because a lot of places, you have to buy splicing tape, which you have to find on eBay because they don't really make it anymore. Because when we get it, we get in these great big huge rolls, and we have a machine that goes and splices it, cuts it, and pops holes all in it at one time. And nobody wants to buy one of those because they're kind of pricey. So this is a way that our customers very easily can go in and cut out the stuff they don't want, put it together with the painter's tape, and then when we're going through and cleaning it, we see the painter's tape, we pull it off, and we splice it properly. So it's just something I've always done. I don't know if other people do it or not. They ought to because it makes it easy on your customers. Boy, no question. So the painter's tape is actually holding the two ends butted up one to another. There's no gap in there. Otherwise, you'd have a, a sticky point that would be exposed, right? Right. And you always want to make sure, even though we're cutting that whole section out, you always want to put it on the non-emulsion side, the side that is shiny, not the dull side. The reason that you do that is because when it's on the reel, if you don't tape it together and you're sitting there going through and you have a small piece, it can fall off the reel. And it's, oh, my goodness, where did this piece go? Right. That makes perfect so that sense. Way, right. So that way you won't have the problem. All right, Tom, we are going to take a break. And coming up in three minutes, we will take another listener question for our preservation authority, Tom Perry, when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. We 
are back. It is our final segment of Extreme Genes for this week, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. Tom, you're getting all kinds of emails from people asking questions. This one is from Donna Valley, and she said, Hi, I'm trying to scan old color photos to use in making a photo book on Snapfish for my son's 40th birthday. I have an Epson Perfection V500 photo scanner that I've not ever quite figured out how to use all the functions. And when I use this or another scanner in the past for a wedding video we made, the scan photos had lots of white particles on them. It wasn't <laughs> it wasn't dust on the glass, but something happened when we did those. I don't want that to appear on the page for the photo book. What tips do you have for scanning these like DPI and cleaning them up? Thanks so much, Donna Valley. Well, that's a great question, Tom. I've done a lot of this as well, and that does come up a lot, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It happens a lot of the times. What do you use, being the non-professional? What does work for you? <laughs> well, I use Adobe Elements to clean these things up. First of all, it's a cheaper program, and it has really all the features that I really need. I'm not a real expert on that stuff, but I think I clean up photos very well. And we could talk about the ones from the 70s that had all those little ridges in them that were awful. That's oh, a different yeah. thing. But just normal photographs from the 80s, the 90s, the O's, and then back before the 70s, all have those white little specks in them. And I use uh, basically a healing tool on Adobe Elements that cleans up a lot of those. And you can also use the cloning tool, which is great. You find a color that's just about exactly right, and you fill those things in. It is amazing how many cracks, how many little bits of dust and white marks that you have on there that you can clean up and make a photo look almost new again. And then, of course, there are the adjustments you can make in contrast and uh, depth of color. All those things are available and very easy to do. Sometimes I'll spend a half an hour on some of these photographs. I'll scan them at 1,200 DPI because I like it at a high DPI to do this work. And then if you want to make the size smaller, you can do that. But it's really difficult to try to make it bigger if you scanned it at too low a DPI. Wouldn't you agree, Tom? Oh, absolutely. That is so important. Scan is the highest DPI you can. But then there's so many things you can do. Elements, like you say, comes free with a lot of scanners, so a lot of people have elements. If you want to go the pro version, really get into doing some fancy stuff, then buy Photoshop, because Photoshop does incredible right. things. And the thing is, you look at that picture, and to our eyes, it looks like it's smooth. You go and put that under a magnifying glass, and you look through it, you're going to see all kinds of dimples and stuff that it's not perfectly smooth like you would expect it to be. And the higher the DPI scan is, the more it's going to pick up those things, which is fine. So scan it, the high DPI, then go make a copy of it. Don't ever, 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 ever edit your original. Always make a duplicate of it and do your editing on that. So if you ever have to go back, you can. And even some things, you can go in and there's a filter in Photoshop that's called blur. And you go, well, I don't want to make my picture blurry. Well, it's so small, you don't really notice it. So if you scan something at like 2400 DPI and you go in and blur it, it's still going to look better than if you scanned it at 1200 DPI. So you don't really see the blur. What it does, it kind of merges the colors together that are really, really close because those white spots are usually very, very small. And just by using the very light blur tool, it will go in and make it look really, really good. And like you say, you can always go down, but you can never go up. So scan it as high as your machine will allow you to. Then go in and blur, do some different things. And it's just amazing what you can do with these pictures. And it's great fun, too, Tom. But uh, great talking to you again, and have a great time. Be safe on the road, and we look forward to chatting with you next week. My pleasure. And if you have a question for Tom Perry, you can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com, or you can post your question on his Twitter page, which is at asktomp. Hey, thanks for joining us for the show this week. Don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It is absolutely free through our website, extremegenes.com. Also, sign up for our Patrons Club at patreon.com slash extremegenes, or again, through the link at extremegenes.com. Talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows... We're a nice, normal family.